Spider-Man kills the Marvel Universe and it's amazing. You guys are gonna love this story. I know you guys love it when horrible things happen to the superheroes and like everybody dies. This story initially opens up focusing on the Punisher Frank Castle. Now, bear with me here. Spider-Man becomes a huge part of this. And in fact, he's kind of the catalyst behind basically the death of everybody. So what ends up going on is Frank Castle is actually tracking down Deadpool. Now, of course, Deadpool, as he's presented here, when the story was written at the time, is very reminiscent of that version of Deadpool. Over the top, silly, he won't shut the heck up. And what Frank Castle says is he says, this is the 33rd time I've hunted Deadpool. The 33rd time I've killed him. I've buried him, burned him, dropped him in the Hudson River, weighed him down with rocks, even fed him to the lions in the zoo. This time I'm thinking pieces, right? Cut him into pieces. That might work. And that's exactly what he does. And then he puts him in different parts all over the city. And so following this, he gives us this bit of an exposition on what happened. Now, here's the kicker. Frank Castle is initially going to tell us what happened from his perspective. Then we're going to get Spider-Man side of things. And that's when stuff gets really, really cool. So he says, this is the world now, right? This is all there is. As far as I know, it didn't start with Daredevil or Deadpool. They were caught up in a wave that swept the whole world. It didn't start small. Life is not that subtle. And he says it started with the kind of big sprawling superhero supervillain fight that New Yorkers see all the time. The kind that makes people think it's just another day in the Big Apple only it wasn't. And so what ends up happening here is that in the midst of what's basically a sporting event, Spider-Man shows up fighting Rhino. The problem is once he overtakes Rhino and attacks this guy and basically subdues him, he starts screaming about how like the meat is his, right? And just starts like eating Rhino, like literally consuming Rhino on the spot. No, this is not Marvel Zombies. And so the Fantastic Four ultimately step in and they subdue Spider-Man. And so the initial indication here is that Spider-Man having his faculties, basically being able to think reasonably, so he is, by all standards of measurement, his normal self with the kind of reduction in his intelligence. Of course, Reed Richards being the smartest person in the Marvel Universe, arguably, people start asking him questions. And what he says is that Spider-Man's not any kind of a mindless killer, right? He can think, but his higher reasoning functions have basically been disabled. He's been reduced to a more primitive state, kind of a cannibalistic predator, and he's effectively just become simplified. Now, Spider-Man basically being held by Reed Richards allows Reed to examine his blood. The problem with this is that everybody believed that Spider-Man's actions were a one-off. And then Frank Dukes, the blob, walks into a diner and eats everyone there. And then following that, things start to go south, right? Frank Castle says the next day, a school bus full of kids went on a killing spree in a shopping mall. By the end of the week, the staff at a Philadelphia donut shop formed a tribe and declared war on the coffee place down the road. The women of The View went after the audience with knives. Daredevil killed and ate a couple of nuns, stringing their finger bones on a necklace that he made from a rosary. By the time people knew there was a problem, there was no time left to stop it. The news feeds kept going on for about 10 days. By the end of it, hysterical stuff, religious stuff, and then nothing. And then he says the internet went dark after about a month. By then, most of the power companies were folding. People panicked, but there was nowhere to go. The plague was basically everywhere, and it wasn't at the same time. People, whenever it wasn't in a location, people brought it there. And so he says, at first, we tried to capture and control. Then we had to start killing people. Later, it was all we could do to stay alive as the infection spread. And every day was a bad day. Every choice was a hard choice. He had to kill Captain America. Susan Storm, took out Franklin and Valeria, which is really kind of Marvel's way of nipping Franklin in the bud, right? I mean, he's a kid that has the ability to warp reality. One of the things that Frank Castle muses about is he doesn't know if Susan Storm did it because they turned or if she did it as like a mercy killing, right? To basically ensure that they would never have to go through any of that stuff. Following this, he says the thing formed a tribe in the shell of the Baxter building, killed a lot of the spandex crowd and then ate them skin and bone. And he says it took him nearly a year to figure out how to take this guy out. And he says for months, I heard about Pac of resistance, rumors of immunity. Maybe it was true, but it didn't really matter. Sure, some people didn't seem to turn savage, but the ones that did ended up killing them. So none of it made a difference, right? Thor was one of the last to fall, and he ended up killing Hercules and Ares, and then literally donned his hammer and took off. So while we're not given a definitive answer as to where it was that he went to, we can largely assume he ended up going to Asgard and likely turned everybody in Asgard and everybody out there died. But for Frank Castle himself, what he does day in and day out is 
is he hunts for a guy named Zero, basically Patient Zero. Now you can tell by just looking at the clues on the pages and so on and so forth, it's obviously Spider-Man. But what's going on here is that Spider-Man is basically leaving clues for Frank Castle. For example, he leaves a body of a guy who was not infected and had basically been killed. And so what this does is it tells Frank Castle, there's survivors here. So if there's one survivor here, there's more. That's what Spider-Man's telling him. So it's kind of, you know, follow me, right? Sort of leading him into the darkness. And so Frank Castle goes as far as to sort of muse how all this happened in the first place. And what he says is that in his time when he was doing Frank Castle Punisher stuff, right? Just acting and never really thinking, that word had reached his ears of what basically seemed to be an arms deal that was going down. And that all he really heard was like small and portable. So he assumed it was a suitcase nuke, specifically because it was like some Russian underground criminal bosses who were basically meeting for this exchange. Frank Castle, basically being an idiot, shows up and shoots the place up, guns everybody down. Come to find out, what was actually in this briefcase was a substance called Survivor 118. And what this was designed to do was basically allow humanity to achieve some measure of post-apocalyptic life in the aftermath of like a nuclear fallout. So in the face of humanity facing some sort of a pandemic or some kind of nuclear fallout in the aftermath of nuclear war, this substance was devised to basically rework the structure of humanity. When Frank Castle shot all these guys up, he was blasted with a huge dose of it, and that seemed to basically make him immune to the initial plague. But in turn, the liquid itself seeped into the water and the sewer systems, which in turn basically infected all the crops. You had scientists and people who were arguing and bickering, but the average person was none the wiser. So in this seventh month time period between when Frank Castle shot these guys up and when the substance entered into the water system, all the way up to when Spider-Man attacked Rhino, people had no clue what was happening. They were just traveling around the world, taking this virus along with them. So in effect, this was COVID before COVID. <laughs> and so what ended up happening is that by the time people started to realize something was wrong, it was a great big, huge blow up, right? It was Spider-Man attacking Rhino and eating him. And so it was kind of nuts because Frank Castle kind of blames himself for the fall of everything, right? He kind of believes he's the reason why everybody has effectively died. But in the end, he's still trying to find like Spider-Man. He's still hunting for patient zero, the guy who started this. And so in his travels as he kind of continues to make his way through here, he ends up coming across the Incredible Hulk. Now, the Incredible Hulk by this point in time isn't even really feral. And in fact, I would argue this environment is really the most conducive to the Incredible Hulk, where he's effectively being left alone because no one out there is stupid enough to attack him, right? It's the Incredible Hulk. And because the Incredible Hulk is basically hungry, he immediately goes after Frank Castle. Now, the funny thing about this, and I'm not entirely sure I agree with how this was done, that what had happened is that somewhere along the line, the Incredible Hulk had basically ripped Wolverine to pieces in that giant battle out there in Brooklyn and in essence ended up consuming him. Now what he'd also done is broken his arm off which seems to be impossible given the nature of Wolverine's adamantium bones although the adamantium doesn't actually solidify across the entire arm it's the joints and things so I guess you could pull it apart. The part that I'm not so sure about is Frank Castle ends up taking one of the hands of Wolverine with its claws extracted places it under a tank applies the right kind of leverage and snaps off one of the claws and then in turn, he basically attaches it as an arrow and shoots it through the eye of the Incredible Hulk. Now, I have a hard time believing Frank Castle would somehow be able to break off one of Wolverine's adamantium bones, but it's a comic book. Who cares? Go with it. So in the midst of all this, while he's basically escaping from the Hulk because there seemingly is no way to kill him, he starts hearing a cry for help. Now, when he gets there, this is when things get crazy because as soon as he arrives on the scene, he ends up basically seeing this priest, right? This priest that's down there with this kid. This basically calling for aid. Now, this is kind of their hideout. They've been here for quite some time, but they also need help to effectively escape. The problem is that in the middle of all this, Venom shows up and Venom literally starts attacking him. Now, the funny thing about this is that the way that he's depicted, he looks like one part Venom and one part anti-Venom. There's not really a definitive way to tell. He just kind of doesn't really give himself a particular name, just calls himself Venomous. But the thing about this is that Frank Castle is able to basically take this guy out using a combination of arms and armament, fire, different things along those lines. The symbiotes are relatively easy to defeat, at least they were back then, but where Frank Castle's able to basically get this priest to a measure of safety by freeing him from the pit. In turn, you end up finding out it was a ruse. It was basically a trap. These guys were led here, right? They were basically forced here by Venom, but when Venom was destroyed, the second guy showed up, which is basically Deadpool, who has essentially returned. Now, it doesn't immediately happen right off the bat. Instead, Frank Castle ends up leading the priest and the kid back to his base of operations. And what's so interesting here is that the priest 
despite everything that's going on, while he is a little bit cynical due to some of the, the decisions that he's had to make, what he also has, I guess maybe by virtue of his own religion, is still a belief in the sanctity of life. And so in telling his part of the story, what he says is that before everything popped off, he basically ran a soup kitchen. But somewhere along the line, an infected person showed up, everybody else became infected, and it drew even more infected. And so basically, the whole place turned into a slaughterhouse. Now he tried to find people and help them where he could, when he could, and he said even at one point, he had hundreds of people that were being kept safe, right? They were being protected by all these different cannibals that he had helped to basically rescue. And during this time, he had to do things like kill people. The priest approaches Frank Castle from this perspective that he's quote unquote, doing the Lord's work, which is to say, getting rid of all the infected to make the earth a better place for the uninfected. The reality is it's anything but. The priest does not really understand what goes on with Frank Castle and his mindset. And in fact, when he gets to Frank Castle's headquarters, you end up finding all the people that Frank Castle had killed, right? They're, all their heads are on spikes. Magneto, Namor the Submariner, and all that kind of stuff. Even Black Bolt, which isn't really surprising because Black Bolt sucks. But the thing about this is that the, the priest and Punisher have this kind of conversation where it's one of those things where it's like, surely you have to understand that indiscriminately taking these guys out, that it can't be done from a place of malice or anger. But the response of Frank Castle is, no, for me, the world became a lot simpler, right? Everything that was important to me, that mattered to me, had basically died, right? Him, of course, referring to his family, which is kind of the thing about Frank Castle, right? His family was killed, it all went topsy-turvy. For him, whenever he looked at the world as it existed before everything went nuts, you had all these different shades of gray, right? You had like people who kill somebody, but then it turns out to be manslaughter. A person robs somebody, but they do it out of a place of desperation, which they wouldn't have normally done it. Then you have criminals that just do criminal things. But in this world that he's in, there's the infected and the uninfected. Done. And that's it. He kills the infected. And it's exceedingly simple. It's a life that he loves. It's a life that he relishes in, right? It's a very simple way to live. But the problem is that in the middle of this whole conversation, Deadpool reemerges. And of course, we're not given a definitive explanation why initially, but we basically end up finding out Spider-Man's forces are the ones that freed him. They dug him up and then basically put him back together so his healing factor would take care of the rest. But when he arrives here, he's basically waving a white flag, right? He's like, no, 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 don't attack me. I have a message, right? My boss, the big cheese, Zero, the guy you're hunting for, he has more survivors. He wants to meet. He wants to talk, right? He wants to have a powwow, right? Like a parlay. And where Frank Castle initially rejects it and even asks the question, why would I go there and talk to your cannibalistic boss? I kill you guys. The response of Deadpool is, no, you don't understand. He's already here. And Spider-Man has effectively arrived on the scene and snatched up the kid and the Padre. Now, this is when we get into Spider-Man's perspective and we find out how far gone Spider-Man is and how his actions basically led to the death of everybody. Not only that, there's somebody worse than Spider-Man out there. What he says here is that when the whole plague basically broke out, that Peter and his forces broke into a tribal mentality and so did virtually everybody else. What you had were effectively the rise of like warlords and petty strongmen. And they started emerging and essentially seizing control. Now, because you had superheroes out there and even supervillains, because there really is no differentiation anymore, but because you had powered people, some of whom were weaker than others, then much like a post-apocalyptic landscape in this day and age, the weak flocked to the strong for some measure of protection. And that's exactly what happened here, right? That you had Spider-Man due to the fact that he has a spider sense, which allows him to overcome virtually any foe or at the very least survive any attack outside of facing off against reality warpers or people with insane levels of magic or something along those lines. But because of his, really his capabilities, he was able to outmatch and outclass a majority of people out there. So just by Spider-Man on his own, he cut a swath through pretty much the entirety of what remained of those people who had powers and were infected. Not only that, we, we get one of the most haunting aspects of this, and I'm curious to see how you guys feel, because anybody who's read this story is like, oh my God, I know what's coming. Yes, you know what's coming. When there's this giant battle that, that went on, right? Peter Parker and his guys, what he said is that there's seemingly somebody behind the scenes who was pulling the strings, that was pitting all the different tribes and those survivors against each other, driving them into conflict to basically thin the herd, right? To, to kind of clear the landscape for them to seize total control. But what had happened here is you did have kind of a handful of humans and superhumans who had survived and had never become infected. Iron Man, Captain America, so on. Now, Captain America eventually did become infected, but that at this point in time, he was not. But the problem here, and even what Frank Castle says, is he says, the last 
wave of uninfected heroes stepped up to help. Iron Man, Captain America, Wolverine, a few others. These would have been legendary battles, but no one's writing history books anymore. Those that didn't fall in the battle fell to the bug. Iron Man thought he was safe in his climate-controlled suit, but why would he get a free pass? Locked in a tin prison, Stark screamed for five whole days. Literally, what happened here is that when everything started shutting down, right, and when, when they, when, when Frank Castle refers to as the bug, all we can really indicate here or really infer is that it's just kind of either a technological glitch or power just shutting down to everything. But by whatever manner and whatever means, Tony Stark was locked in his own Iron Man suit. He was stuck. His suit became a tomb and he died in it, just screaming for help and nobody could get him out. It's a fate worse than death. It's pretty bad. But what happens here is that basically Spider-Man reveals that the person who's kind of been controlling things behind the scenes is what's called the King of Death. But the thing about this is that he's not just some arbitrary guy who does things, that he is incredibly intelligent and incredibly cunning and incredibly ruthless. He is hard core. And so what ends up happening is a deal is struck between the two. That what Spider-Man says is, if you travel to the King of Death and you get my mate, bring my mate back to me, then we will have a cease and desist, right? We will not attack you. We take Manhattan. You can have the rest of the world. Without the King of Death, all those forces out there will fall into a state of disarray. You'll be able to continue your campaign of killing people. They'll be scattered, leaderless, and divided. So they'll be easy to pick off because they won't have any kind of a unified front. You will effectively win, right? Right? All I want is for you to get my mate and I will give you the survivors. And so ultimately Frank Castle says deal. And so what he ends up doing is he goes out there into just the kind of wilderness, if you want to call that the urban jungle, but he's also accompanied by Deadpool and a couple other people who were sent by Spider-Man to assist him in his efforts. Once they get to the prison of the King of Death, Frank Castle essentially snipes a few of these guys who are out here seeing all these survivors and then realizes it's a trap that these survivors that were put out there, they were put out there as a distraction, basically to lead Frank Castle into just kind of jumping into doing things first and not thinking, because that's Frank Castle's MO, right? He sees, he shoots, he asks questions later. And so by taking advantage of that, it allows these guys to essentially attack him. And so in that moment, they're able to subdue Frank Castle and take out basically the forces of Spider-Man, albeit minus Deadpool, right? That guy, of course, continues to survive. Frank Castle tries to throw some grenades, but then he ends up finding the mate of, uh, of, of Spider-Man, who, of course, is Mary Jane. Watson. Not only that, while these initial, I guess this first wave of infected were destroyed, the second wave steps in, they overpower Frank Castle, but this time it's also the King of Death who's revealed to be the Kingpin. Kind of a perfect antithesis to Spider-Man, right? Of course, Kingpin is incredibly intelligent. He's incredibly ruthless. He's cunning. He's a great villain. Probably one of the greatest villains that Marvel Comics has ever had. Now, of course, because the King of Death, because Kingpin wants to expand his sphere of influence, but Spider-Man and his forces are the thing that stand in the way. Frank Castle is able to kind of help get some of the survivors out of there to basically get them away as fast as they can. And then in turn, you basically have him being subdued yet again and then taken prisoner. And so once he's being held up by the King of Death, the first question he asks is, where's Spider-Man and his forces, right? Where's Zero, as this guy is known? Give me his location and I will I will wait a little while, but I mean, I'm still going to eat you, right? I'll just, I won't make it as painful as it could be. Now, of course, Frank Castle refuses to spill the beans because his loyalty is to the survivors that Spider-Man still has. It's very altruistic in that way, right? All those innocent people out there are counting on Frank because Frank knows that if he dies and if Mary Jane Watson dies, all those people, all those survivors, they're just going to be food. They're going to be eaten. And like, that's really all it is. And so in response to this and the fact that he will not give any information, Kingpin basically starts torturing Frank. Now, of course, Frank has endured all this stuff time and time again. So it's, I wouldn't say it's nothing for him to endure. It's nothing that he can't handle, right? Nothing that he's incapable of dealing with here. And so in this moment, when all of this is happening, the priest alongside the kid show up with like all these guns, believing that like they can help Frank Castle. Of course, they have no idea what they're doing. They're immediately captured. They're thrown into the prison camp with everybody else. And like, that's it. Kudos to them for trying. Right? I mean, I don't want to like dismiss them, right? Like you idiots, you know, you shouldn't have tried in the first place. No, kudos to them, right? For having the courage to try to pull it off. But they were subdued incredibly fast because they're not trained killers. Now, of course, the next thing that the King of Death does is he in fact threatens to kill Mary Jane. But she even tells Frank, do not tell him the location. 
I would rather that my mate lives on and the survivors survive than anything, right? I'll take myself out and that'll be it, right? Like I will sacrifice my life for the man that I love. And so while Deadpool is one of those people who's being kept in a prison and being monitored by the Red Skull, because the Red Skull's kind of an idiot in this reality right now that he's infected, he's not as intelligent as he normally is, Deadpool's able to kind of goad him and then attack him, take his key, free himself, grab all his guns, and then go to the aid of Frank Castle, right? He overcomes these guys quite readily, frees Frank Castle, and then in turn, Mary Jane Watson actually sees what Frank Castle is about. From her perspective, Frank was here to rescue her and basically help the survivors live under the control of Spider-Man, right? He would free them all because it was genuinely the right thing to do. This guy draws his guns and kills everyone indiscriminately, right? I mean, the survivors, of course, survive, but all the infected, anybody who's begging, anybody who's asking for aid, anybody who's saying, wait, 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 you know, I surrender, I surrender, no quarters given. They are all eradicated with swift vengeance, right? I mean, it was, it's judgment day here, guys. Like, I mean, this is the hand of God, right? Just sweeping over this camp. <laughs> That's what Frank Castle is, man. This guy is the wrath of God in human form. And in fact, even when the King of Death is basically injured and is literally just kind of there, and I wouldn't go as far as to say begging Frank Castle, but saying like, I know you, right? I know what you want. You want me to beg. Frank won't even let him finish the sentence. He just executes him on the spot. And like, that's it. From there, he grabs Mary Jane Watson along with the priests and the survivors and then takes them back to Spider-Man's camp with Mary Jane Watson being rescued and Spider-Man, of course, being able to reunite with his mate. Now, the crazy thing about this is in turn, he has this inner monologue, right? Which is very reminiscent of Punisher Born, right? For those of you guys who remember that story where he basically sold his soul to the devil in the Vietnam War and eradicated just a massive number of people. He says the happy reunion, a real hallmark moment. And Spider-Man chimes in and says, you keep bargain, bring back my mate, my family. And then in turn, Mary Jane says, I'm sorry about what I said back there. You are a good man. You saved us all. The response of Frank is to pull his gun and he executes Spider-Man on the spot, right? Just kills him right there. And like, that's it. And then when the question of the, of the priest is like, for the love of God, why would you do that? The response of Frank is because I don't make deals with monsters. He's a bad guy. He killed people. He wiped out most of the Marvel universe. That guy needed to die. And that's just the way that it is. The survivors are good guys. The monsters are bad guys. And there is no, there is nothing in between. That's it. It's just this extreme perception. And so following that, Frank Castle basically puts the survivors on boats where they end up swimming over to Brooklyn, I believe one of the other five boroughs. And then in turn, his response is like, this place is not a place for survivors. It's not a place for the innocent, right? This is a place of monsters. This is a land of wolves and there are nothing but wolves here. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this to an end. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments section. Thank you all for watching. I will catch you all later. Peace.